12. What's up guys, it's Howie. I just came back from a 12 hour night shift and I'm not quite sleepy yet, but I'm not quite tired and I'm still kind of awake from my last sh hour. During the last hour of my shift, I get really energetic and then I can't get to sleep, but give me about a couple hours. So I figured I'd use this time to put up a video. Hi. And let me tell you, this week was kind of exciting because we did a couple of social things, uh, my friends and I, and uh, we went to a mystery room or an escape room or whatever you call it. And at first I got a little bit nervous because it was full of guys that I had never met before and I was put in a team that was I guess was one of the medium hardest rooms in the facility and I didn't know anybody but one person friends but for the most part I didn't know any of the other six people that were in that room so we went into that room and it was called the voodoo room which was very mysterious but really cool and once they shut us inside everybody just spread out and just started looking for clues and they were just moving things around opening up cabinets and just kind of like running around like a chicken with his head cut off but and I just felt like useless you know but there was something that changed in me when that happened when people were just running around back and forth and they were grabbing things trying to see if that led to a puzzle I kind of started to calm down a little bit and I started to look around at the big picture and it was similar to when I was part of a code um, as a student and I'm still a student, but when I was in a, a huge emergency codes, uh, I've seen, I've worked in huge emergency codes in the psych unit before, and I've seen a couple of codes, uh, like code strokes and code blues, but I wasn't an ICU nurse, and I'm still not yet, but I saw exactly what was going on, and I saw the patient in an acute. So yeah, when we were in the escape room, uh, it was a voodoo themed room, and everybody just started to spread out. And they were looking for things to do, something to un unhook or a drawer to unhinge. And they were just basically ripping the place apart. And at this time, I felt a little bit useless, but my training started to kick in. I felt like maybe, you know, I need to contribute something to the group. And if everybody's working on their own, I think I should step in and try to see the big picture because everybody was so focused on the details. And I started to see a pattern. I would look into a statue and I would just observe it and see that it had some kind of a special marking. And then I would look to the other side of the wall and I would see masks and uh, other trinkets that had the same kind of marking with these other trinkets like statues and bottles and stuff like that. So once I started seeing that there was a connection, I tried to get everybody's attention and said, hey, you know, I know you guys are busy, but if you could just listen to me for a second, I think that there's a connection between these trinkets and that mask. And if we can find a way to connect them together, then maybe we can. So eventually we were able to pass the room in record time and we were, we escaped. <laughs> And that was really cool. That was fun too. It felt like it was a good reward system and it felt like it was a good group activity. But I thought, hey, maybe I could use the same training for when I'm in the hospital and I'm working at the ICU during my externship to be able to calm down and think about what the patient needs at that time. So I'm hoping that that skill and that kind of a feeling would be the same. And um, yeah, so that's the adventure at the escape room. Another thing that happened to me was that I picked up a shift at a brain injury foundation and there was people who had injuries either from a stroke or hypoxia from a near drowning incident or trauma, stuff like that. So they were high functioning people, however they had had cognitive difficulties and I felt like it was sort of when I was working with the VA and the veterans PTSD facility over where I live. Uh, everybody was high functioning, they could walk, they could talk, uh, but they still had a little bit something off. 
Well, the people in this uh, brain injury foundation facility, um, they were not as high functioning and not all of them had PTSD, but they had a hard time uh, living on their own, which is why they were living in this facility. And so I was their nurse uh, for the day, for a couple of days. And there was a lot of the same things that you'd see in psych. There was people who were very adamant about getting their uh, Ativan and benzodiazepine. And I had to be able to ration that out so they could stay uh, with having enough medication for them to last for the rest of the day uh, without being too sedated. And I also had to give a lot of insulin for a lot of the people because they had, ha they had become diabetic. And some were just, you know, actually just older, so I had to take care of their dentures as well. So it was kind of like being in med surge, uh, but also half being a school nurse, you know, like everybody needed you for something. Like I had a couple of uh, medical assistants, but they technically couldn't give the medication. They could prepare it like I did, but they couldn't actually administer it to a patient, which was necessary for some people because uh, some people had a swallow risk and they couldn't swallow the medications on their own. So I had to crush it up and then give it to them or I had to thicken their liquids uh, so they wouldn't aspirate on really thin liquids like water or juice. So there was a lot of stuff that I had to do on my own and I thought that was a really fun activity and it was great to be like the one and only nurse there that people was asking about. Like another time one of the other patients started to started to cough and then he he sounded like he was choking i heard him from the other room so i went over there tried to look at him and he was just <coughs> but he was still kind of breathing and talking and then one of the you know the head the head manager said hey do we need to take him to the ed and i said no you know he's he's choking a little bit but i can see that he's breathing and that he's moaning and he's not completely choked or he's not completely choking and it wasn't blocked and he didn't look like he was panicked nor did he have the universal sign, you know, stuff like that. So uh, the, I was consulted for emergency reasons as well. So everybody, about 10 of the patients that were in that house was my responsibility. And I like the fact that even though they're not bed bound, uh, I was still responsible for what I had to do to take care of them, for them to be able to go about, to go about the rest of their day. Um, so that was fun. Um, I think that hopefully I'll be able to use some of that experience when I'm dealing with patients who have had a stroke in the ICU or who have intracranial pressure or hydrocephalus or stuff like that that involves really detailed assessment, a neurological assessment in order for me to see whether or not they're actually within their normal baseline level of consciousness. Because some of these guys um, range from very high functioning to, you know, sounding like you and me on an everyday basis to uh, having very difficulty communicating or they have a hard time uh, saying what they want and so they get frustrated and then they become anxious and agitated. So, you know, it can be very frustrating and difficult to be able to get a back and forth communication with them and I wonder if that's going to help me out when I'm in the neuro ICU and I need to be able to see and empathize what those patients are feeling when they can't talk to me. So. so the last part of my week happened was when I threw a barbecue for my friends. It was a nice little barbecue for about a handful of people. It was in my apartment complex in the middle of the pool. Uh, area and those cabanas and fireplaces. It was really nice. I live in a pretty nice apartment complex and After a while when my friends came in uh, We had a couple of drinks and I was really glad that my bestie cooked because I suck at cooking and he was able to do all that and I just took care of the invitations and the publicity and Getting everybody communicated so that they knew where they were going to be uh, arriving and the address and whatnot so after a couple of drinks, our, our nice conversation started to go into questioning how I was able to afford the place that I live in. And it's like, I mean, I live in a very nice place. It's hotel, it's resort living kind of a space. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that the rent here is really high, even for San Diego. And, you know, like I'm using a lot of money and I'm paying a lot of money 
to live here, but I think it's worth it because I've had nightmare situations where uh, I had either, I haven't lived with a roommate in about a decade, but um, I've had neighbors who are nightmares and they just wanted to know everything about me and they were complaining about every little thing, um, especially if I worked night shifts. Um, they complain about me coming up and down the stairs, which I had no control over. So, you know, a lot of stuff like that. So, this is the reason why I like paying for uh, even not a huge apartment, but a, an apartment in a lovely place on the top floor and stuff like that. But uh, we also had a pool and we had a barbecue. And then when we were having that barbecue, people started to ask me, Hey, how can you afford all this stuff? I thought you were just a student nurse. And I wanted to emphasize, hey, but that like, look, I not only go to school, I also have a lot of student loans, but I've also saved a lot, a lot, a lot of money when I was in the military and I was working full time while, while working as an undergrad. And I used that money to be able to invest and uh, pay, it paid off dividends. Now, I'm really blowing through a lot of my savings right now, but I'm really hoping that I'll get a job soon that's stable. But in the meantime, I'm still working as an LVN on every single free time that I have. Whenever I have any ounce of energy, I go out there and I work as a free agent for a home health company, which is what I just came back from working for. Uh, so I did a lot of hospice work and I do a lot of uh, home intervention, stuff like that that doesn't need me to be in the hospital, but needs me to go into other people's houses and take care of them. And that's how I've been able to earn my money as a nursing registered nurse student uh, to become a nurse practitioner. And I'll continue doing that even when I become an RN to work full time uh, while I'm going to school. This time it won't be as crazy because the nurse practitioner program isn't accelerated like the RN um, pre-licensure pre part of the program was. So yeah, people were just starting to challenge me about not only, not only could I, uh, how I could afford to live here, but also like what my nursing knowledge was. Like for example, people started talking about like crack cocaine. And I know they don't do that, but they just, I don't know, the conversation just went there. I guess it's because of the opioid, opiate crisis and people who have been dying because of too much addiction to opiates. But um, it eventually got into the subject of drugs and then that came into the subject of, hey Howie, what if I took Xanax uh, while I was drinking? And I'll, I said, whoa, whoa, don't take Xanax when you're drinking because it's a complete downer and you're not gonna be able to, you know, you might not be able to get out of that uh, if somebody's not there to take care of you. And then everybody looked up and they're like, no, how he didn't say Xanax, he said Zantac. And I thought, oh, I, I guess I only heard what I wanted to hear. And you know, that just kind of set off red flags. I f they were just like, do you really know what you're talking about, Howie? And I'm like, okay. First of all, I'm a little bit buzzed. And second of all, I, when I'm in a barbecue dinner and I'm entertaining for my friends, I. I don't expect to be grilled on my medical knowledge, even though I should know exactly what I'm talking about. And I was ready to explain, you know, the, the interaction between Zantac and alcohol, talking about first pass and liver metabolism and all that. But I just didn't want to talk about that when I'm socializing with my friends and I'm trying to entertain people. You know, that's not entertaining to me. I don't want to talk about medical shows like Grey's Anatomy, which sucks, by the way, or, um, you know, like even decent medical shows like Chicago Med and um, All Saints, that Australian nursing television show. Uh, yeah, so people think in this day and age that they know exactly how everything in the body works because they've Googled up like one specific niche of the medical system. But I think the reason why our jobs are going to be pretty secure still uh, is because life does not work in complete algorithms. Yes, we use a lot of algorithms, but people will present in different ways and they'll have comorbidities and these problems can't just be solved by Googling it up and typing it up on, on Dr. Google, you know, and trying to figure it out just based on a general, uh, a general list of symptoms. No, we don't act that way in our professional field. We actually have to look at the patient, see how they're doing, and then watch them and observe how they do over a period of time. And so, but however, all your friends, I guess the parties, if they're not going to show you some, if this is what they do when I'm at a party, they, 
immediately they know I'm a student nurse and they don't know I'm not, I'm not a real nurse yet but a real registered nurse but they'll right away start showing me like warts and like skin issues which is the biggest thing by the way um, and they'll start talking about weird uh, weird diseases and niches of, of, uh, of I don't know like um, weird epidemiologies and uh, I think I'm getting tired. <laughs> I think it's time for me to start going to bed because I'm finally starting to get sleepy from that 12 hour shift. But my point is, is that even when you're socializing, if people know you're in the medical field, get ready to answer some medical questions. And there's only two ways you can go about that. One, you can just be very discreet and you can be very conservative with your responses. Or two, you can try to out out verbalize them with how much knowledge you know and then try to contradict what they say and try to make them feel inferior stuff like that but i feel like that that's a losing battle losing battle i just more side with like the make a joke and kind of downplay it and then continue on with a different conversation but that's just me so yeah those that's what happened to me this week i number one was that i went to a mystery room and found out that it was similar to working um, like a long code <laughs> where you have to work as a team in order for you to escape that room. Uh, number two was when I worked over at the Brain Injury Foundation facility and at this particular facility there were many people that had a lot of mental health issues uh, usually not just you know psychiatric, psychiatric mental health issues but also uh, mental health issues that they derived from trauma uh, and that was interesting to see and then finally, uh, just a little bit of a note to myself and any other viewers that are going to be throwing a party. Just remember that if people, anybody thinks that, or every, anybody knows that you're in the medical field in some way, shape, or form, that they're going to challenge you or ask you some kind of medical advice. So be ready to either go in the direction of just being uh, conservative with your responses, or you can be less tactful and just try to out talk them somehow <laughs> and uh, let me know which one works for you and tell me about your experiences on the comment below and uh, I'll see you next time bye time for bed good idea uh, okay. make, make a fun event out of it it's a social thing and then you leave the food <laughs> I need to do that I need to watch what I eat I, I'm a stress eater so the more stress I am the more crappy I eat I try to balance it with I work out the other day I wanted a well being. <laughs> what if you get tired? Like, what? Well, how do you like get the energy if you get tired? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I sleep my eight hours. You know? Yeah, I sleep my eight hours. Yeah, I'm not sure. 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 Schedule change, yeah. you're gonna be tired, yeah. some That's meeting pops well, up, you're gonna be in the next batch. Yeah. Like, like, if, if I, if I go to...